guys, this is Robin Pegnell from the Flea Foxes. All right. Uh, thank you for being here. Dude, thank you for doing that. It's, it's a real pleasure. And uh, Let's talk about the title of this record, Crack Up. Crack Up. Where is it from? How did that enter your life? It entered my life. Um, I, <laughs> just at, I don't know. I just randomly. It's I re a, it was it's a book. It's a book. It's a S S F. Scott Fitzgerald <laughs> collection of essays. Uh, I believe Scott. they were prepared for Esquire magazine. Yes, from Esquire magazine, <laughs> 19 whatever, 36. Um, but I read the. I found a collection of. I, I, I had read. I was like rereading books. This was before I went back to school. But I was like rereading. I reread Great Gatsby, and then I hadn't read Tender as the Night, so I read that. I loved that even more than Great Gatsby. And then I wanted to find something else by him, but I didn't really want to. There was like another like Last Tycoon or something. It just seemed like too. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so then this one was like an essay collection with these kind of ephemeral letters and uh, journal entries, and so I picked that up. It's called Crack Up, and um, so yeah, I just I thought it was an evocative title. There are some things from the the essay that I thought th th were interesting. How long did you know that this was going to be the title for the record before you made the music? The whole, yeah, like four like years. Like right or when you found the book, you're like, that's it. Crack up. Yeah. And then it kind of took on additional meanings. And so I was like sitting with that, like, oh, you know, crack up, what an album like that sound, you know, maybe kind of fractured and kind of jumbled and like it's been broken and put back together, which was like kind of the, the approach on some of the music. Um, and then, and then once I was like in school, I was at Columbia University, and so I like I thought, and which doesn't really play on the album to me at all. But I thought if because it was, it had the same initials, I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so you're de you're decoding your own record for yeah. se secret meaning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. And then you sit with something, you like look at something for months and you know, yeah. years. You're like, oh, that's also what it means. <laughs> but. So you, you got the tunes, uh, and it's time to record them. How much of this stuff was ready by the time you got into your first studio, and how much was written in the studio? Um, everything except two songs. Uh, Fool's Errand wasn't written, and then um, the third song, Nyad's Cassidy's, wasn't written. Those two weren't written, but I kind of had, I had just question marks for three and for nine, but I knew that there would be... I knew that that was the order of them, you know. Right. But I had so I had the flow of of everything else. Um, but those two it was just songs didn't exist that needed that need that could bridge the gaps for, right. for song three and song nine. And this is about about a, a year, right? In in the recording, mixing, mastering kind of thing. We officially started recording in September, so it was only a six month process. But that was like five, there was four years or three years of right, right. like a. Uh, low-key pre-production, yeah. you know. And uh, how many studios, and how did you pick those studios? Because um, you, you recorded this all over the place. <laughs> yeah, we started at Sear Sound, which had this great Neve console. I wanted to re record on that console. It's the old, uh, uh, the old hit factory in Hell's Kitchen in New York. Um, and then I, I knew, we started recording there, and I knew I wanted to mix album on that same console. It was only a 32-channel console, so we had to do a lot of stem, a, lo a lot of uh, bouncing and, and stemming down so to make every track fit on the board, because some of the songs have like 90 or 100 tracks, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you know, a lot of them had to be mixed in sections and then assembled together in mastering. Right. You know, because they just couldn't, couldn't make was it. Was that difficult to kind of get a, a, a coherence, like bringing so many different sources into one mix? Or, or once you wrap your head around it, it all just kind of Yeah, fit. once you kind of know, because yeah, you, you keep, keep certain things on certain channels, so those have a similar EQ or a similar compression channel or a path, you know, so, so those things stay the same. So we did Sear Sound, and then we went to a friend's house upstate and for a couple of weeks and just kind of process what we had recorded there and then kept adding stuff and is this just you and Sky at this point? Me and, that was me and Sky and Morgan yeah. and then um, we went to from there we went back to Seattle recorded with the rest of the guys in the band for three weeks um, and then we went back a couple days of a studio in Brooklyn called Rare Book Room and then we went back to New York and we kind of set up shop at Electric Lady for like two months right. and we were but we were in this small project studio upstairs there so 
we didn't have an engineer with us, and no one was kind of, there was no like a uh, chaperone or anything. So we were just, for the most part, it was just Skylar and I. And we would bring in, you know, drummers or string players or uh, bring people in for, for a, day or, a day or two. But it was like this uh, cabin fever kind of. I was gonna odd couple like Grey Gardens up there. <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I had to shout out one of my other favorite Cabin Fever Electric yeah. Lady records. Totally, totally. And actually, I, the I roots. See a resemblance. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were like uh, I think the roots were actually recording there when we were when we were there. They had taken over a lot of uh, a lot of those rooms when we were there. And that 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 upstairs was Jimmy's apartment, right? Mm -hmm. So Jimmy Hendrix's apartment. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Uh, you have done the fans a, a major, major service with an influence playlist that you put up on Spotify. Yeah. Um, this... Uh, and I Zach has all of them. Because <laughs> <laughs> he has the most amazing record collection of <laughs> anyone. Not, that's not true. Uh, well, I was going to say, I couldn't have made a better mixtape. So, wow. well played. Um, We've got a bunch of stuff. I'm gonna just kind of show these guys a few, and and I would like you to tell us a few specific things that you gathered from these rather brilliant sources. So yes. We've got a some some A plus singer songwriter records from yes. Judy Sill, Fred Neal, Karen Dalton. Mm -hmm. As, when you were opening for Joanna, yeah. you were covering the Dolphins. The Dolphins from yeah. this Fred Neal record. Great what, song. what made you pick that tune to cover? Um, to impress you. <laughs> it worked. Sixty per sixty percent of the things I do in this. <laughs> true. That's Zach Howie. That's not true. Um, but it worked. Okay. I was like, "That's my boy." <laughs> uh, and then I, I was I was blown away at at this snippet of a cover of a Curtis Mayfield song. Uh -huh. uh, you covered the makings of you off this Curtis record. Amazing album. Are you going to release that? Yeah, I want to re actually record it and release it totally. Thank you, because yeah. that is a big move. Yeah. And these two I've, I've grouped together. Many Rippertons yeah. Come to My Garden and Electric Prunes, Release of an Oath. I think the production from Charles Stepney on this yep. and from David Axelrod on this yep. are really hand in hand. And uh, is, is that something that you kind of studied? Because the orchestration on this record is amazing awesome thank you um yeah the, the that that synthesis on those records that kind of like uh orchestral psychedelic music or that kind of dry drums or these persistent drum beats that are accompanied by these like big swells of strings and like the the contrasts in there um that are like i i respond to a lot on That's that music in that music same i was yeah. also like really blown away when you told me that a lot of those strings were done in the smaller studio at Electric Lady, because uh, yeah. they sound like Abbey Road those, A, those, you know? <laughs> those players were so amazing that they were able to, it was a string quartet, and then they were able to uh, tr overdub and overdub and overdub onto themselves, but, but without any weird intonation stuff, like any weird in, uh, intonation drift or, so they could keep layering and it just started, just, just sounded fuller and fuller and not kind of weirder and weirder, more, or more dissonant, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, this one, your show off choice. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I'm right. Uh, Steve Reich, music for 18 musicians, total masterpiece. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that guy? Well, that, that was mostly, like, a, there's a lot of, um, on the second song, I was trying to build these repetitive um, woodwind and marimba and piano uh, loops and patterns, and, and that, you know, drawn drawn from like the, the repetitive minimalism yeah, that. No, you nailed it. I really, uh, I, I think that's like creation through repetition and you totally yeah. hit it. And awesome. It's, I've, I've been listening to this all week and I love it. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> really psyched about uh, <coughs> Black Saint and Sinner Lady from Charles Incredible. Mingus and the Money Jungle record, mm -hmm. which we listened to at my house once. Yes, we did. Um, something that I kind of, want to draw attention to is the liner notes to Black Saint and the Sinner Lady, which are written by Charles Mingus's psychologist. <laughs> 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 uh, Mingus asked his psychologist to write the liner notes, and he's like, I'm not qualified. And that's, the psychologist says, uh, but, but Mingus is like, go, do it anyway. 
He says, this is the uniqueness of the man. He jolts with the unexpected and the new. He has something to say, and he will use every resource to interpret his messages. And this is something that I, I hear in this record is you're totally fearless in, in terms of like the structure that a folk record or whatever yeah. somebody's going to file this section, you yeah, know, whatever totally. section it is. You break all those rules, and one of yeah. the most astounding examples to me is, is the field recordings and the sampling. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the sampling first, because you, uh, you cite a lot of these like, amazing Ethiopian records mm -hmm. as, as influences. We've got Imahoy, <coughs> I can't say it, Helu Mirzea. Helu Mirzea. That's a great album. This is, There's but, a few, like on 3rd of May, like the, um, when 3rd of May bottoms out, like six minutes in or something, and this kind of like those soft synthesizers come in, playing those triplet patterns, those those uh, improvising. That's just three three synth tracks improvising in a pentatonic scale, like, and that's just straight off the Hailu Mergia, like the. Yeah. And then the 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 biggest move is you you sample a Muatu record at yes, the end of On the Other very, Ocean. Yeah, very lucky to get that sample. Yeah, uh, I, the the track. The track's title translates to nostalgia. Yeah. Is was it the title or the song itself that made you want to include that on the record? I had those the the two main pieces of music that make up that song. I had those as separate things, and I was like, neither one of these is complete. And the, but they were the most different from one another, in my opinion, of the th things I had to work with for working on the record. And then putting them together, I just made me laugh like all the time. <laughs> like every time it, the transition happens, <laughs> it's just like you know. It's not so bad, you know. Just like this, this, this turning on a dime and kind of like a like the second half is a referendum on the first half or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so, because the first half begins, the first little snippet of it is kind of a Mingus esque little like piano modal piano figure. I thought, what, what, you know, what's kind of the opposite of that mode? And it was like th just the Mulatu song because I anytime I come here. Uh, that's the only song I can listen to to tolerate being in traffic. <laughs> is the, just I just have that Mulatu song on, on repeat, yeah. just like, <laughs> and so it always just cheers me up or calms me down or whatever. So Amazing. I thought it's like, oh, that's the opposite song from how it starts. So we were trying to kind of you know make a knockoff for a little bit, but I was like, no, it should actually be if it's going to be on there, it's it should actually be the, the thing. Yeah, brilliant. That that so. that track is uh, it's kind of one of my favorites. Awesome. And Kind of, I like decoded this the other day. Yeah, totally. Uh, that that track is called "On the Other Ocean." On another ocean. On another ocean, and you keep repeating the phrase "On the Other Ocean." Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked you if this is where it's from, and it is. That's exactly where it's from. So tell me about this record and what David what's so Behrman, important about it. Lovely music on the other ocean. Um, that's a song I listen. That's I just listened to this on airplanes. Uh, that's my repeat airplane song, and it's. Uh, some live instrumentation that's uh, improvising in a certain mode, and then there's a synthesizer. This is an early computer music experiment, and there's a synthesizer that's uh, accompanying the the live uh, players and reacting to them in real time. So it just has this really kind of the synthesizer sounds kind of stupid. Like it's not like a great. It doesn't <laughs> always know what to do. So it's like boom, boom. You know, it does these weird little dips, or then just like sustains for a long time. I, what, what I it's love very it. charming. It's charming, and, and uh, this is a big record for me, so I like had to talk about it to Robin. <laughs> what I love about it is it, it never responds the way you think it will, but yeah. it's not like dissonant at all. No. So it, it's like so engaging through the whole thing, and and I hear that in this record. Like there's really no A B C kind of thing happening. Yeah. Which, which I I think is way more cinematic than sure. than anything in the recorded world, and. Also, thanks to the uncut article, I see you've tipped a hat to Nick Rogue, right? Uh, who's one of the best, best directors. Yeah. Uh, in particular, his film Walkabout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Nardwar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nardwar. <laughs> Nardwar. <laughs> And you're not the first musician to be inspired by the films of Nick Rogue. No. These are the, the Jim O'Rourke's, uh, yeah, Jim O'Rourke, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, incredible string of solo records. Each one of these is named after Nick Rogue movies. This is Bad Timing, Eureka, and Insignificance. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the influence of Rogue on this record. That movie, um, 
Yeah, walkabout, bad timing. Definitely, it's just along these lines of, of things that are, that are edited kind of in, in intriguing ways and th trying to take some of those lessons and think about how they could apply in music. And then even like the John Barry score for Walkabout has a, like that kind of big romance so in some the, of the strings. The choir yeah. stuff is insane. Also, uh, beyond the, the sampling, the, the field recording got me very excited. And I want to kind of break down the first track in particular, because uh -huh. there's a lot in there. And that's, I also just want to add how excited I was to play it for these people on a system like this, because yeah. I think like a lot of those details are going to be kind of lost for in sure. the way people listen to music now. For sure. But to hear it here and to kind of try and unpack all the little pieces is so fun. Yeah. Like, How did you record those, those intro parts? Is that on a little handheld or something? I wanted it to sound that way, yeah. But uh, I ended up having to record it. Um, the guitar was recorded to tape um, at Sear Sound, the acoustic guitar. Vocals were recorded at Electric Lady. And then I, I did a few different performances of the, the, the vocal for that just that little intro section, the right. sad little thing. The, um, it's not sad. Yeah. <laughs> but the, I did a few different performances, and then put it through this like f uh, thing that had like a, um, like just like the, the pitch shifter. So yeah. pitch it up in one octave. But I, did, I didn't do that with the performance that's on the main one, but with a different lead performance. So it sounded, there were like enough little differences that it sounded like, okay. I wanted it to sound like, you know, like, oh, I'm all that I need. And I'm like harmonizing with like a computer, <laughs> like on, like on, on, the, on the <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, if you're all that you need, should we tell these people to split? Or <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so that was those little, yeah, that, that little part. And then uh, the end of the track, there's, there's a lot happening there. There's, um, uh, tell us about the, the kids' choir. Yeah, so that was like a week where we were recording Electric Lady, and we were kind of like, let's just, things just kept happening. Like, our lawyer was in town, and he's got this really deep, sonorous voice, and we're like, oh, we should have him like, record something on the... So on that's the, the lawyer on the spoken part. Yeah, it's sunk super down. low. <laughs> and sort of, What's he oh, reading? Uh, oh, he's just reading some little thing I wrote, but I'm going to leave that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then a friend sent me a pic, uh, sent me a little video of this children's choir in, or this uh, youth choir in, in Brooklyn singing, uh, in Bushwick singing uh, White Winter Hymnal, the Flea Foxes song. I was like, oh, we got to use that. You know, we got to <laughs> put that in the song. We were just kind of like, whatever happens this week, let's put it on the record, you know. And so little things would happen that, that made their way in. And the, the, the train? The train now, that's like on the Manhattan Bridge, because I'd go running and walking over that bridge a lot. And I was just noticing that on a certain part of the bridge, there's, it just makes this kind of particular pattern. And so I'd be you know, running alongside it, trying to like match that pattern. And then, and then at certain points, that whatever, why the track was doing that, it stops. You know, so you have to be in a certain spot. and then. Um, so did you go out just kind of chasing? So that just with my phone, I went. I had a re yeah recording of that that train track, and then that is like the where. So that was the first thing in that song, and then the guitar was th that determined the pattern, and um, yeah. So that's like. Um, I guess I wanted some some of the songs I wanted like the combination of things to make this in. Uh, indiscernible sound where you weren't. It wasn't really easy to pick out the individual things happening, but there was a kind of uh, mass. Conglomeration, yeah. and, and the uh, stairs, doors. Wait, was that in studios? When That's it. Sear Sound. They had this stairwell because um, the elevator would always break. <laughs> uh, the elevator. It was like the, the studio was like on the sixth floor. The elevator would always be out of commission or on fire <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be like teams of old ladies trying to get upstairs, <laughs> uh, and so we were always taking the stairs, and then we would start taking uh, speakers and. Um, microphones into the stairwell and reamping, playing things really loud on the speaker and then capturing it on the microphone and then using that as the main it, performance. It, it works. I, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of love that stuff on a record. Yeah. It's such a good way to get you through the journey, that kind of thing. Yeah. The, the artwork. Talk to me about Hiroshi Hamaya. Mm -hmm. Where did you find this photographer and what made you choose the, the image for the cover? I found a book of his photography um, at the, I guess at the Strand bookstore in New York. Uh, and I was just flipping through it. I thought they were really striking and, and kind of psychological and kind of human, even though they like lack a human presence. And then 
he, he seemed like he traveled very extensively, kind of like solo, and I was identifying with that um, a little bit. And then that image in particular, I like that you can't, can't really, at first you can't really tell if it's a painting or a photograph. When I first saw it on, on my phone, I thought it was a painting. Yeah, it almost looked like a romantic painting, yeah, yeah. you know, something um, with that drama. And I feel like well, some of the lyrics address that, like, what's, you know, what, what's the difference between how I see things and how things actually are, or, you know, the difference between fantasy and reality and, like, projecting fantasy onto people uh, and, like, the dangers of that. Um, so it connects to that too, and then just like the, the, uh, the like the competing textures, works to me, and then the eye kind of travels from like the rocks to the water to the clouds, and then you kind of settle in and like the last. If you're looking at it, the last thing you look at, maybe is that top, that like bright spot in the top right corner. And if that weren't there, I probably maybe wouldn't have used it as the cover. But because that just looked like the end of the album yeah, was yeah. supposed to sound, yeah. like with the the those like really close horn. Harmonies that are supposed to be kind of bright and like luminous, you know. And and when, like, at what point in the album recording process did you find the photo and you're like, that's the cover? <clears throat> we had it was one of because we were in that studio for so long that we started and we had most of the walls were covered in these post-it notes of things that we needed to record or just columns of just notes from for songs and stuff and then we started putting up photos from that book. Um, just to kind of make the space more uh, uh, more our own, okay. yeah. So it was just kind of part of that whole. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that that's it for me. I I'm just really happy that you did this. I'm very grateful. Thank very you grateful so much. to the label folks for getting this together, mm -hmm. and to this crowd for being fantastic. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Robin. Thank you.